AITA for standing up to my ex's new girlfriend after she confronted me about our past. So I, 28F, used to date my ex, H 29M, for all of middle school, high school and college. I was convinced we'd be together forever, growing old with kids and grandkids. We still love each other but we broke up six years ago. It was a mutual decision because we knew it was for the best. We just moved into our first apartment when I found out I was pregnant. We were 22 and completely freaked out but decided to make it work. The nursery was almost ready when I lost her at 25 weeks. I don't talk about it much and neither does H we try to keep things together after that but it was too much, and we split up. Losing our daughter pulled us apart, and we didn't know how to fix it, so we let each other go. H still sends me flowers on Mother's Day, and I send him a card on Father's Day. We even call each other on her birthday every year. Since we went to college together, we share some mutual friends, so running into him at parties is not rare. I saw H with his new girlfriend at a friend's birthday dinner. She acted weirdly rude to me the whole time which was odd since I'd never met her. Apparently, H mentioned that he and I used to date, but didn't go into details since they hadn't been together long, and he wasn't ready to share everything. Later, she cornered me in the bathroom and told me she didn't like how close I was to H, she said six years was enough time to get over him, and that it was ridiculous how desperate I seemed to get him back when he clearly wasn't interested. I was already fed up with her attitude all night, so I told her the baggage she wanted me to get over was our child and that H would probably never get over her either. I added that her insecurity wasn't my problem, and if she wanted to be with H, she'd have to deal with me because I was not going anywhere. She got super red-faced and left the bathroom. When I came out later, both she and H were gone. I told a mutual friend what happened, and he thinks I was an off for saying all that. He said she didn't know the whole story and reacted like any woman would if she thought someone was hitting on her boyfriend. He says I should have been more considerate of her, not knowing the situation. If I went too far, I'm ready to apologize. Just trying to figure out if I cross the line here. Eda Info I do love H, but I am not in love with him. There is nothing romantic about our feelings for each other. I've known the man my whole life, he was my child's father and best friend, I will always care for him. I have no idea why she thought I wanted him back. I'm not interested in being any more than what he and I already are to one another. I've been in therapy. So has he. Both therapists have zero problems with the way the two of us go about remembering our daughter. I told a friend about it because it happened at his birthday dinner and it was clear to everyone at the party that something had occurred. Edit number two. I will reiterate again that I am not in love with H, I don't want him back. I'm currently engaged. I didn't mention that in the op because I already stated that my relationship with H isn't romantic. I didn't yell at her. I spoke to her at an average volume. I rarely talk to H outside of the one phone call a year. We don't interact much when I see him because of our mutual friends. So I truly, and honestly, do not know why she felt the way she did. Edit number three. This post wasn't technically about the loss of my daughter, so I didn't go into all of the details, but no, it was not a miscarriage. I went into her labor and she died an hour after she was born. So yes, she has a birthday. Yes, she was our child not a fetus we lost. Update. Hi, I thought I'd update you guys on the situation since it's more or less over now. I was able to call H and talk to him about what happened. I started apologizing for telling his girlfriend about our daughter before he could share that with her. Still, he told me I didn't need to be sorry. They had left the party early because apparently everyone had heard her going off on me in the bathroom. They didn't hear my response, but when she came out looking red, they assumed that I had, at the very least, said something back to her that hurt her feelings. H and the girlfriend started arguing, and he thought it was best not to disrupt the party further. He didn't know how to discuss the situation with me after she told him the whole story, because he figured I would be hurt and upset about the entire thing. I wanted to know why she thought I might have been trying to get him back when we've been separated for six years, and I'm engaged to someone else so I asked him if he knew. He admitted that before I got to the party that night, as he and his girlfriend were coming in, someone brought up my engagement, 
and then another person said something about how they had never imagined that H and I would have ended up with anyone but one another. H said he just pretended not to hear the conversation. Still, I guess his not immediately shutting it down upset his girlfriend. I've always been a sore spot for her since H told her that he and I had been together for so long, so I guess that just made it worse. The two of them have broken up now though. Which I feel a little bad about. I want H to be happy, and never want to intervene in his relationships. He assured me that he doesn't blame me for it or anything, so that did help me feel a little less guilty. I do want to thank all of you who expressed condolences. You're all so kind, and I wish I'd been able to respond to you individually, I just had a lot going on. I appreciate everyone's feedback, too, it was beneficial. And yes, I later informed my friend that most women don't get weirdly jealous and react like that. Comment Anonymous She had no business approaching you. Her relationship is with your ex. She should discuss any concerns about his relationship with you with him and leave you out of it. Your mutual friend's attitude is strange. No, any woman would not approach an ex at a party and create drama. That's not what average women do. When we hold outsiders accountable for our relationships, we prefer to hear things we may not want to hear. That's the situation this woman created for herself. He didn't say anything unexpected or over the top. Her choice is to continue dating your ex or not. You're not involved in any way. He is the only person responsible for his relationship with this other woman. Animal Lover, 38 also all Op did was show up to a mutual friend's party. Ike where the mutual friend got the going after your ex part of this from. Unless H still talks about Op as if he's still in love with her, that would be an H issue, not an Op issue. Throwaway Hater 3343 Kinda curious about where the new girlfriend got this from. And why the friend defended the new girlfriend. Is there something about her behavior that Op is not telling us? Info needed. Eat a prop edits, if she hadn't had any weird interactions with H at the party, then definitely in TA. I'm curious about just what H told the new girlfriend. Some people get crazily rabid about exes, and they usually aren't worth the time. AIT for not wanting to tattoo my cousin on his wedding day. I'm a woman and a tattoo artist with four years of experience. I recently opened my own studio. My family and I are heading to another state next week for my cousin Matt's wedding. We received the invitation months ago, but Matt recently told me, you're gonna tattoo me on my wedding day. I was caught off guard because I hadn't considered bringing my equipment. I asked him if he had a machine or something, hoping he was joking. He replied, don't you have one, and added that bringing it wouldn't take up much space. I explained that I was not prepared to bring my entire setup, machine, colors, hygiene supplies, stencils, etc. To a wedding where I knew nothing about the venue layout on such short notice. Matt insisted it was important to him, and that I should be the one to do it. This was the first time I had heard of this request. I tried to explain again that I wasn't comfortable with this, especially since I work until we fly out, and designing a tattoo takes time. Matt read my messages but didn't reply. This morning, my mom called me, clearly upset. She asked why I couldn't just make it work and tattoo Matt. I told her the same things I told Matt, but she didn't want to hear it. She said it would be a huge deal for her and Matt's family if I did it and suggested it could be my wedding gift. Then, she abruptly hung up. I talked to my brother about it, and he just shrugged, saying it would be nice of me. Now, I'm feeling conflicted. Am I being selfish for not wanting to do this? It seems like everyone wants me to, but I'm unsure whether I should push myself out of my comfort zone in this way. Edit. I already had an actual wedding gift as they sent out a wish list with their invitations. One point on the list was artwork because they recently moved into a bigger house and wanted random artwork to decorate. I spent several days oil painting something for them, so I also didn't plan to give them a voucher as a gift. As far as I know, Maddie doesn't have any tattoos. I'm not sure why my mom is so insistent on this. I think she just wants to keep the peace. The last few hours have been eventful. First, I called my mom and while, she asked me again, this time very nicely, if I would tattoo Maddie at his wedding. Again, I said no, giving her all the reasons I previously explained, plus some of the very good points you all suggested. Before she could say anything else, I added that I felt she wasn't taking me or tattooing seriously. She didn't say anything for a while, then tried to explain that she thought it wasn't a big deal. I told her it was, and that she of all people, should know how my job works. She agreed and apologized profusely. I then asked her if she'd like to attend one of my client appointments to see me work, and to my surprise, she said yes. 
Mom is tagging along tomorrow. Now, on to Maddie, or rather, his bride. I finally got hold of the bride. Let's call her Becky, and I asked her about Matt's request. She seemed surprised, as she'd heard from my aunt that I made them something for their new house. She assumed it would be a painting since I'm the artist of the family, and it's known that I also paint. I confirmed that but explained that Matt had come forward with this tattoo idea out of the blue, and it wasn't a good idea for many reasons. She immediately agreed with me, I think she has tattoos. She thanked me for telling her, as no one else did. Becky seemed really mad, but managed to hold it together. I would have lost it. I'm assuming Becky confronted Matt after a call because, about three to four hours later, I checked the family group chat. There, I saw a message from Becky, there will be no ceremony on the 13th as Matt and I have decided we aren't getting married, Matt and I have things to figure out, so please text or call us tomorrow if you have questions, we'll be in flight mode for the rest of the day. After dinner, Becky called me and apologized for Matt again. She said it was his stupid idea, and that he just thought it would be cool. She then informed me that she still wanted me to fly over for the wedding day, as she'd be hosting a party instead of a wedding. Everything is paid for, and she wants nothing to go to waste. I asked if they broke up. Not yet, but I'm staying at my sister's place until next week. I assume Matt hasn't been too great, but I'm sure I'll hear about it soon. Apparently my brother and mom aren't invited, lol. My call must have been the last straw, but as far as I'm concerned, Becky is handling it gracefully, and Matt will be okay too, I'm sure. So, I'm going to a party. But have I just made a new friend? Because many of you wanted to know how the bring your mom to work day went, I picked her up in the morning, and we headed to the studio. I showed her around, told her a few stories about some of the artworks and photos on our walls, and explained my routine as I prepared everything. My client arrived, and I handled it like I usually would, just with my mom sitting there lol. I explained every step of the process, and she asked questions about my ink, needles, technique, etc. It was a lot of fun having her around, and she really surprised me with her openness and interest. When I was done, my mom had to leave for work. Still, she thanked and hugged me for bringing her along. She said she enjoyed spending time with me and loved seeing me work professionally. She now sees my work and efforts differently. As for the wedding slash party, the party started at 2.0 p.m. as the ceremony was canceled. I arrived and was immediately welcomed by Becky's sister, who hugged me and helped me with my painting. Everyone was outside, drinking and having small bites already. I went to say hi to Becky and she hugged me warmly. She seemed tired, but otherwise fine. Becky was also smiling a lot, which surprised me I went to mingle as I didn't want to start by questioning her. I met many of her friends and apparently most weren't too fond of Matt. I heard a few things about how he tried to change Becky to be, more like his ex and stuff like that not a great look, Maddie. No friend or relative of Matt's was around, besides me and one other cousin. Later, as we sat down to eat, I asked if I could join Becky's table. They said yes, so I sat with Becky, her sister, and three friends. I introduced myself to one of them, I hadn't talked to him before, and Becky added that I was Matt's cousin, the one who was supposed to tattoo. A simultaneous oh came from everyone, and with that, the conversation was about Matt from the get-go. I asked what happened. The sister just rolled her eyes and said, what didn't? Becky and her friends told me that a while ago, Matt apparently started to pick on Becky for being herself in various ways. It started small, like asking her to change her workout routine to only running, then criticizing her cooking because he prefers eating more meat and traditionally. They discussed these topics, and it always seemed fine, but he didn't stop. He asked her to let her hair grow or get extensions and speaking of hair, to lighten it, Becky has shoulder-length black hair. More and more things piled up until he started commenting, can't you be more like my ex? He didn't say it specifically but clearly meant it that way. His ex is from Texas. I was shocked and asked why she didn't break up with him earlier. Becky explained that, in the moment, it didn't seem as bad as when you listed those reasons. She had made a few changes to make Maddie happy, but continued to do what she wanted most of the time. Time went on, and the issues resurfaced again and again in different ways. The last big fight was a few weeks ago when Maddie called Becky by his ex's name. They somehow settled this, so let's skip forward to when I called Becky about the tattoo idea. After our call, she approached Matt and asked why he didn't talk to her about it, and why he would just decide to do something like that on their wedding day. He explained that he wanted to surprise her and stuff like that. Becky told him this wasn't happening, and that she wanted to be able to enjoy the wedding and their honeymoon. They seemed to agree in the end, and he apologized. But later, this almost threw me, as Becky was starting to cook dinner and Matt was sitting at the counter, they talked about tattoos again, apparently a really chill discussion about tattoos in general. Becky asked him playfully what he intended to get tattooed. He gestured across his chest and said, I want my birth date, our wedding date, and your birth date. Becky said she went blind for a millisecond. That third date was, in fact, not her birthday. She asked him again, and he repeated the same dates. She then said that this wasn't her birthday, but he persisted that it was and told her to stop trying to fool him. She started to cry and ran to get her purse to show him her driver's license. That's when his face dropped. He tried to escape it by making excuses that he wasn't good with dates, but Becky just went straight to her phone and checked Facebook. She found his ex's profile, showing her birthday. 
it was the date he would have gotten tattooed on his chest if I hadn't said no and called Becky. My dumbass cousin would have ended up with his ex-girlfriend's birthday next to his wedding date. Becky said she more or less told him it was over, and that this was enough. She started to immediately reorganize the whole wedding and honeymoon, while kicking him out of the house. A bit later, she called me back. She mentioned that she didn't want to say what happened over the phone as she thought I might tell my family, and she didn't want to hear about it. Fair enough, I get that. Becky changed the honeymoon booking and is now taking her best friend. Also, if you're wondering, Becky's dad currently owns their house, and they agreed to pay him back slowly. Due to his financial stability, this arrangement made more sense. As far as I know, Becky is going to stay there. Anyways, that's the tea, folks. This was a wild ride, and I'm pretty sure Becky and I will be good friends, we hit it off. I don't have much sympathy for Matt, so I'm not sure I'll stay in touch with him. AITA for accepting a flower from a homeless man that led to my boyfriend shattering my phone. A few days ago, it was my birthday, and I'm still reeling from what happened with my boyfriend. We were walking home together when we passed by a group of homeless people. One of them gave me a dead flower and said, Here you go miss since you're the first woman who walked by. It was about 10 p.m., and my birthday was right at midnight, so it felt kind of special to me I thanked him and kept walking. My boyfriend didn't say anything, so I figured everything was fine. Later, I pulled out my phone to record a quick video of the flower and share it with a friend, but my boyfriend suddenly tried to snatch my phone away. I laughed and asked what he was doing, but he didn't answer and just kept walking. He seemed a bit annoyed, but I wanted to get the video, so I tried again. This time, he hit my hand hard, causing my phone to fall and shatter on the concrete. The screen protector was completely ruined, and I was devastated. I yelled, why did you do that? And he threw the flower onto the road, saying it was my fault for embarrassing him. I was in tears because. 1. He broke my phone. 2. He threw away the flower, and. 3. I didn't understand what I did wrong. He made me delete the video of the flower right in front of him, and we walked home in silence. When we got back I lost it, crying and screaming, asking him why he did that, especially an hour before my birthday. He said, how would you feel if a girl gave me a flower in front of you, I replied. If it were the same homeless woman we see all the time, I wouldn't mind. We've passed by this guy a lot, he called me a liar and said I was being manipulative and disrespectful in front of other men. I don't get how it was disrespectful. It was just a dead flower, and I wasn't even planning to keep it. I thought it was a cool, unexpected gesture, especially right before my birthday. He called me an attention seeker, and made me feel awful. We went to bed without talking, and the next morning, he was gone. I went to brunch with friends to distract myself, but I still felt terrible. I'm not sure if I was completely in the wrong here. Maybe I shouldn't have accepted the flower, but it felt innocent to me. He still hasn't spoken to me, even though his siblings wished me a happy birthday. I'm at a loss and don't want to lose my boyfriend over what happened. Update Hello everyone, thank you so much for all the help. I broke up with him. To be honest, I still love him, and I'm trying to cut all communication because I know that if he contacts me again, I'll most likely go back. I literally made a list of all the reasons why he sucks, and try to read it every time I want to text him lol. Here's the update, he surprised me with my favorite flowers and a letter. He wished me happy birthday and apologized for his reaction. He said he was being immature, and that it wouldn't happen again. He said we should work on communicating each other's boundaries better. He also apologized for ghosting me for a few days. He said he just needed some time to cool down. Not going to lie, I just wanted my boyfriend back, so I accepted the apology under the condition that he will never do anything like that again. He swore on his life that he'd never make me cry ever again. I genuinely saw a shift in his personality. He was even better than when I first fell for him. Like one time, we were cuddling and talking about our relationship, and he literally started crying while professing his love to me. He said that he knows sometimes he gets frustrated over little things, but it's because he loves me so much, and he's terrified of losing me. He shared so many things about his past, he had never opened up to me before, so it really felt like the relationship grew stronger. We went to the beach as a little birthday celebration with his friends. We were six in total and I was the only girl. Two other girls were supposed to come too, but they had work. I didn't know that until I asked one of the guys, and he told me. Long story short, he got mad at me for wearing a bikini. He was like, WTF do I look like having my girl walk around half naked like a hoe in front of everyone. I reminded him that we're at the beach and a lot of people wear bikinis at the beach. He said that it's different because I'm the only girl here with five guys and it makes me look bad. I said I didn't care and went back to everyone. After a little while, he pulled me to the side again. He called me names, said that one of his friends obviously wants to fuck me, but I'm too fucking dumb to see it. He said he overheard him, I don't think this is true, but Ike. He was very angry, but also, he had been drinking, so that could explain his irrationality. I started crying and then went home, because I didn't want people to see me like that. He was being so weird, I don't know why he was being aggressive all of a sudden. Like before the flower incident, he had never used that kind of language with me, especially in public. He came over that night to talk about what happened. I was so hurt, I honestly thought we had grown closer. 
we both explained our size of the situation. I told him I wasn't trying to get anyone's attention by wearing a bikini, and I can kind of understand his point of view because I was a little uncomfortable too being the only girl there. He said I could've put my clothes back on, but I had to stay in a bikini. He said I looked like a hoe waiting to get fucked when I was lying on my stomach tanning. I can't really remember what he said after that, I was just so hurt. We were going in circles so we decided to just go to bed. He then tried to initiate sex, which just pissed me off. I said no every time. I heard him say something about me being an annoying ass bitch under his breath, and that was the last straw. I kicked him out and broke up with him. It wasn't easy, he was crying and screaming the whole time. He even punched a wall in my room. I was terrified, I never thought he could do that, we had never fought like that before. He finally left when I dialed 911 and threatened to call. I don't know why I still love him so much, I understand his reactions, knowing his past and what he's been through, and it's a lot, trust me. I know it's not an excuse, but it's still an explanation, right? Anyway, it's over now. Half of my stuff is still at his house, but I don't even want to think about it right now. He's blocked, and I am really trying to villainize him in my mind so I can move on, but it's hard when all I can think of is the amazing moments we shared. Like the time he was crying in my arms, telling me he loved me more than life itself, or the day he asked me to be his girlfriend, or when he gave me a promise ring. Maybe I did go wrong somewhere. It's just so crazy to think that all of this could have been avoided if I hadn't accepted the flower. I know I'm dumb for thinking he could change so quickly. I just wanted my boyfriend back. Thank you again, everyone, for the advice. Final update. Hey everyone, I think this is the final update on the situation. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I went back one more time. I know it was a stupid choice. It's hard to explain, it's like he has a hold on me. At first, it was just about the sex, nothing more. We didn't want to completely cut each other off, but I didn't want to officially get back together or start meeting new people, so we agreed this would be the best option. And for a while, it actually worked. After the fifth or sixth time, we decided to try getting back together, but to do it right this time. I laid out my boundaries, no yelling, no cursing at me, no hitting, no going through my stuff, and being respectful. I made it clear that if he crossed any of these lines I would leave him. I told him I wasn't his emotional punching bag, and just because he's been through a lot doesn't mean he can take it out on me, especially since I've never treated him that way. He agreed to everything and shared his own boundaries with me, no yelling, being respectful, modesty, and not going through his stuff. I also read some comments about how punching a wall can be the first step to punching someone, so I told him that could never happen again. He agreed, and even booked a therapy appointment. He's really committed to self-improvement, anger and impulsiveness are his only real issues. We both wanted this to work. Our anniversary is coming up, and I didn't want to break up right before it. Things were going fine, until he sent me a TikTok of my post and accused me of exaggerating everything, basically calling me a liar. I'm attaching some screenshots because to this day, I still don't understand why he was saying all that. I got mad and called him, and we ended up screaming at each other on the phone. I felt like he was making everything about himself again, and dismissing my feelings because he was embarrassed. He came over with my stuff and broke up with me, insulting me the whole time. I didn't want things to end like that, so I asked him to stay and talk. Long story short, we ended up screaming at each other again, and he broke my MacBook. I'm so done. Luckily, I'm not going to school this semester so I won't really need it, but he still broke it. Like, what the heck? I'm reading the book that was recommended to me, and it's hard to accept that my boyfriend is one of those people. I'm glad he broke up with me. I know he's not good for me. He hates me now, and it's for the best. I know he won't bother me again, and I have no reason to talk to him now that I have my stuff back. I'm still learning a lot, like what love bombing is, I didn't even know that's what he was doing. I know I'm naive, and that's why I want to stay single for a while. I don't want to end up in this situation again. Thank you to everyone, especially all the women for sharing your stories and helping me when I needed it. ATA for planning my wedding while SIL is getting divorced. My sister-in-law is SIL and I have never really seen eye to eye. We have different views on life and how we live it. While I try to be respectful or indifferent about her choices, she's always trying to impose her beliefs and choices on me and her brother, my fiancé. My fiancé and I, 26M and 26F, have been together for seven years, and we have a super loving relationship. He proposed six months ago and I started planning the wedding three months ago. Our relationship is strong, with great communication. We still go on dates, love dressing up, and share activities and hobbies. Nothing's changed, we're more in love than ever. On the flip side, Asael has a different outlook. She was married, and her marriage was one of those where they brag about how much they can't stand each other. She would mock me and my fiancé's relationship, calling our dates and dressing up bullshit, saying we only did it for attention and didn't really love each other. She also couldn't wait for us to end up hating each other in the future. SIL and her husband filed for divorce two months ago. Honestly, I'm indifferent about it. I don't feel sad or happy, 
just don't care. Yesterday, my mother-in-law, M.I.L., and father-in-law, F.I.L., came over for dinner. As I was talking about some wedding details, M.I.L. confronted me and asked how I could be so happy and excited about planning a wedding while S.I.L. was going through a divorce. My fiancé tried to intervene, but M.I.L. told him to shut up, calling him a terrible brother for not supporting his sister through this tough time. She also said I had no empathy for S.I.L. and was only focused on my wedding and my silly dates. I told her that I don't feel sorry for S.I.L., who bragged about hating her husband and being in a loveless marriage. They got what was coming to them. I won't feel bad for someone who mocked my happiness and relationship. M.I.L. said I was incredibly insensitive for saying that and expected an apology from me as well as from S.I.L. She left after that, telling us to call if we wanted to apologize, and only then. Additional info M.I.L. didn't want us to cancel the wedding per se, but she wanted us to either delay it or at least not be so excited about planning it because the family is going through a rough time. They almost broke up a week before the wedding. That's all I'll say. My fiancé shares my views. He's expressed his feelings to his family multiple times, but they often dismiss him, saying he's just joking, even when he's dead serious. Sometimes when he expresses discomfort with S.I.L.'s mockery, they call him too sensitive and say he can't take a joke. Top Comments They don't get to decide how sensitive you should be or what kind of behavior your fiancé should tolerate. It's not a joke if you don't find it funny. You need to start enforcing boundaries with consequences. You're telling them that you don't appreciate their language or behavior. Now you need to back it up with some consequences. Don't call them. Your fiancé should send a text saying that their behavior and comments are rude and they owe you both an apology. Don't engage with them until you get a genuine apology. If they do apologize, and it should be a real apology, not just an, I'm sorry you feel that way type, then if they misbehave again, the visit or call should end immediately and they should be put on a timeout. This behavior needs to stop now before you get married or have kids. It might help if you and your fiancé went to counseling to learn how to deal with them. People who mocked my relationship and bullied my family wouldn't be welcome near it. At some point, you might have to decide if keeping contact with them is beneficial. If they're just bullies who refuse to change, you might be better off without them. A good counselor can help you navigate this relationship. Participant 1 So she belittles you and your fiancé, a congrats on the wedding, by the way, for having a loving, healthy relationship and it's excused as just joking. But when you call out S.I.L.'s toxic relationship with her ex-husband, everyone's shocked. That's just lovely. Participant 2 Well, then they and S.I.L. are too sensitive about the divorce. They should be celebrating, not mourning. It sounds like S.I.L. always needs to be the center of attention, and your wedding takes that away from her. A.I.T.A. for refusing to take in my brother-in-law's kids while family tries to pressure us. We're in a tough spot right now. My husband's brother Jack and his wife Linda tragically died in a car accident, leaving behind two kids, 14-year-old girl and 11-year-old boy. My in-laws are heartbroken, as are the kids' other grandparents. However, since the grandparents are in assisted living, they can't take the kids in. They want to keep the kids in the family, so they're pushing for one of Jack or Linda's siblings, Sam, my husband's sister, Linda's brother George, or Linda's sister Amy, to step up. Currently, the kids are staying with George. But his wife only agreed to take them in temporarily. Money is tight for them, and recently, she told George that if he tricked her into taking the kids permanently, she'd leave him. Now George wants out. Sam's sister lives in New York with roommates, so it's down to us and Amy. Amy has been telling the grandparents that Sam and I will take in the kids without even asking us first. All five family members have called Sam to insist it's the right thing to do. But honestly, we can't. Our house only has three bedrooms, and we already have three kids. We can't afford a bigger place, and there's no basement. Amy argues that we're the only ones who can take the kids because she and her husband are child-free and don't know how to care for kids. She also suggested that if we don't take them, we'll be responsible for her brother's divorce. She said since we already have three kids, adding two more wouldn't be a big deal. Plus, she claimed we have extra income, which is not true. We're also struggling financially. Linda's sister is married to a high-earning consultant who makes more than both Sam and I combine, so I don't understand why she can't take in the kids and learn to parent. Amy just says she and her husband travel a lot, he for work and she tags along. Last night, my in-laws called again, begging us to take the kids. Sam is considering it, but I told him no. I'm working longer hours to ensure our kids have a college fund. I didn't put in all those extra hours just for my kids to either not go to college or to be burdened with huge debts. 
I told Sam that Linda's sister should give up her traveling before we make our kids share rooms and use their college funds for their cousins. Sam suggested we ask the kids if they're okay with it, which really upset me. I'm not about to make my kids feel guilty, so that a woman who likes to travel can keep doing so while everyone else struggles. Right now I'm considering telling Sam that if he involves our kids in this, I might leave him too. I don't want Jack and Linda's kids to think they're causing trouble in our family, but this situation is really tough. I've told Sam we need to convince the grandparents to find distant relatives, we can help search, or get Amy to stop her permanent vacation. Update, thanks to everyone who offered good advice and resources via direct messages. I called my state's Department of Children's Services by getting approved as foster parents. They said we can only have two kids per room, and they must be of the same gender, so we don't meet the requirements for housing, unless we only take the boy. There's no way the kids or the grandparents would agree to splitting them up. They also said we can't use an RV as a bedroom. I also called about the kids' social security benefits. They can get $900 and a month because it depends on how much their parents worked. Jack worked occasionally, and Linda did not. Sam and I have explained that we're not legally eligible to take the kids, so now the grandparents think Amy should step up. I don't think she will, but we're staying out of her discussions with them. It's better than what she did to us. I'm exploring other options to help find the kids a place to stay. One idea is to make Amy ask her and her husband's friends to help find good and safe foster parents, and we can visit the kids if they want us to. I think she'll do it this time because she's the only one left who can legally take the kids, unless the laws in Georgia State differ. A note, for those who are child-free, I respect that choice, but Amy shouldn't volunteer us without asking, and then expect us to take on responsibility while she avoids any effort. Being child-free doesn't mean she can offload her responsibility onto us. AITA for laughing and saying, I told you so, after the paternity test results. I, 27F, have been married to my husband, 28M, for two years, and we just had our baby girl about five weeks ago, our little one came out with blonde hair and pale blue eyes, which is a big surprise since both my husband and I have brown hair and eyes. My husband totally freaked out over this and demanded a paternity test. He even threatened divorce if I didn't agree. So, I went ahead with it. After we got home from the hospital, my husband decided to crash at his parents' place for the first three weeks. He needed space, and he filled his parents in on what was going down. My Amiel called me up, saying if the test proved the baby wasn't his, she'd make sure I'd get the worst divorce settlement possible. Thankfully I had my sister to help with the baby during all this. We got the test results yesterday. My husband came back to our place to go over them together. I was on the couch, he sat next to me, and we started reading. The results confirmed he was the father. His face went from shocked to totally mortified as he stared at the paper. I couldn't help but say, I told you so, and laughed a little at his reaction. He snapped out of it and got really mad at me for laughing. We had a heated argument, mostly him yelling, until my sister came downstairs and things quieted down. After that, my husband headed back to his parents' house to clear his head. A few hours later, my M.I.L. called to chew me out for laughing at my husband, saying it was like kicking him while he was down. She also sent some pretty nasty texts this morning along the same lines. I don't think I'm in the wrong here, but I'd like some outside perspective. After making my post, I decided to search for divorce lawyers in my area with my sister. It took a while, but I managed to find and meet with one who was willing to do virtual consultations. During this, my ex was not contacting me at all, but I did reach out to see if he was okay. Eventually, once he actually got served, my ex came back to her house and tried pleading with me not to go through with the divorce. He said he loved me more than anyone, and that we could go to couples therapy. During this, my ex slipped up and admitted to cheating on me when he first left me. He said that he got caught up with his co-worker when trying to explain his weeks-long absence. At first, I didn't realize who he was talking about because he referred to her by a nickname, Fink, Vive over Vivian, but my brain kicked back into gear and asked if that getting caught up with her was code for that he fucked her. My ex stumbled over his words and tried to dodge the question, but he seemed to realize that I wasn't going to let up on this pretty quickly. He admitted to going to her for emotional support before our baby was born, since he was nervous about being a dad, and eventually fucking her during the time he left, so you guys were right about him cheating. I had heard enough at that point and told my ex point blank we were going to divorce, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, and that I wanted 50 to 50 custody. We'd only speaking about the divorce, custody arrangements, and our daughter herself after this. My ex just nodded to what I was saying, and asked if he could see our daughter. I was a bit hesitant, but said yes, and called my sister to have her bring our daughter down to the living room. My ex held our daughter and talked to the baby for a bit before leaving. 
My sister asked me if I was all right after he was gone, and I told her I was okay. Maya Mile did try to harass me over the phone about me divorcing my ex, but by then, I had already blocked her so she went to my sister instead. I guess Maya Mile was never told that I owned the house my ex and I previously shared since she texted my sister, saying that I was going to be on the streets. Well, my M.I.L. most certainly knows that now, since my ex is now living with her and moved out. My ex has seen our daughter a few times, those visits were awkward to say the least, but I managed. Hopefully I won't have to give you guys any more updates about this. A.I.T.A. for publicly shaming my parents for not acknowledging my birthday? I just turned 33 last week. It was supposed to be a chill day, but honestly, I wasn't expecting much. My family had been away for a few weeks, they flew to my mom's home country for my maternal grandfather's funeral. He passed away about a month ago, and I wasn't super close to him, so I stayed behind since I had just started a new job. They were gone for 22 days, and we stayed in touch the whole time, via FaceTime. I was happy they got to reconnect with family, and my brothers met everyone. They came back last Wednesday, and they've been jet-lagged and readjusting since then, which is totally understandable. My birthday fell on Friday, just two days after they got back. I was expecting maybe a quick message or call, but the day came and went without a peep from anyone. Sure, I was a bit annoyed, but I wasn't too upset. I don't make a huge fuss over my birthday anyway. I ended up having a nice dinner with my boyfriend and a few friends so it was all good. Then on Saturday afternoon, my dad calls me, and he's fuming. Apparently my boyfriend had made a special Instagram post for my birthday, and my brothers saw it. They showed my parents, and that's when all hell broke loose. My dad was shouting at me, saying that posting about my birthday online was passive-aggressive and mean because they'd forgotten. I was honestly shocked. I told him I wasn't upset and didn't think a 33rd birthday was that big of a deal. He kept going, then just hung up on me, I didn't hear from them the rest of the weekend. Then this morning, I woke up to a ton of notifications. My mom had posted on Facebook, blasting me for being ungrateful, and claiming I ruined a surprise party they had planned. She tagged me in the post, and it seems like all my extended family is siding with her, calling me a jerk. I tried calling my mom to talk things over but she's not answering. So, I posted a reply on her Facebook thread saying, you guys forgot, and no one wished me a happy birthday unless you count dad's call to yell at me. Now both my parents are calling non-stop, but I'm not ready to talk to them yet. After everything happened yesterday I told my boyfriend about the FB thing, and he agreed that I should just not deal with it for the day. I turned my phone off and just chilled out. Around 6pm my boyfriend got a text from my brothers asking if they could come by because they wanted to see me and bring me the candy they brought back for me I agree, and they came over along with my parents. At this point I was annoyed to see my parents, but we let everyone in. My boyfriend made sure I was alright and took my brothers out back so I could be alone with my parents. My mom started crying immediately and sobbed out and, I'm sorry. I don't know about you but seeing my mom cry started to make me cry. My dad then explained what happened. Apparently, they absolutely forgot about my birthday, again, understandable. My paternal aunt had come over on Saturday to see my parents. It's worth noting that she does not like my mom for whatever reason. Since he's been around for last four years, my boyfriend follows my brothers and a few of my cousins and vice versa. My cousins saw the post showed my aunt and she asked my mom how my birthday went. A side note, my extended family did reach out to wish me happy birthday, they just didn't know my family forgot. I guess my mom was caught out and my aunt went in on her being a bad mother and all that and saying at least I have my boyfriend. My dad got upset, told my aunt to leave and said they already had something planned, they didn't. That's when he called me. They never saw the post, I was wrong thinking my brothers showed them. My dad said he felt awful for yelling at me and apologized, but explained that he hated seeing his wife so upset. It took the weekend to cool down, but as many of you guessed, my mom tried to save face via FB. She explained that she didn't think I would see it since I'm not usually on. What she didn't realize is that when she typed my name in the post, my username populated thus tagging me. She was shocked and embarrassed when I responded and started getting calls and texts from the extended family. She came clean to my dad about it, and that's when they tried calling, but I wouldn't answer. My mom looked very distraught, and I just told her that everything was okay, and that I'm sorry that I responded the way I did. It's evident that she's taking her father's passing extremely hard, and I don't want to pile more onto her. Now's not the time. My dad said it was a few days late, but he'd love to order pizza and just hang out. I agreed. My boyfriend and brothers came inside and we spent a few hours listening to stories about my grandfather and my mom's childhood. It's definitely a birthday I won't forget, but I guess all's well that ends well. I would like to point out that we do not like my dad's sister. She's an awful person, but my cousins are amazing so my dad tolerates her. My mom can usually handle herself around my aunt, but she's in a really vulnerable state which is how this escalated. I'll probably talk to her about it again, just not anytime soon.
A-I-T-A for calling a girl desperate and pathetic after she tried to kiss my boyfriend during a play. I'm 19 and studying drama at uni with my boyfriend, who is seriously good-looking but doesn't seem to have a clue about it. He gets a lot of attention from girls, and for the most part I just let it slide because he doesn't notice their flirting. But there's this one girl, Victoria, who is totally obsessed with him. She's always finding ways to be paired up with him for group projects. If the professor picks groups by numbering us, she'll make sure she's in the same group as him. It's like she's on a mission to be close to him. Recently, she even stepped down from a lead role in our play to take a minor part just because her character has a romantic subplot with my boyfriend. I've overheard her talking about how she thinks he's hot and all that. I've never confronted her about it, mainly because she seems really insecure. She's always complaining about how she thinks she's ugly, and honestly, my boyfriend doesn't care about her advances, so I didn't see a reason to stir things up. But things hit a new low after our latest play. We had a small afterparty where Victoria got a little tipsy. She was bragging loudly about how she felt a spark during their stage kiss, and how she planned to ask him if he felt the same way. I rolled my eyes and tried to ignore it, but then she actually went up to my boyfriend while I was standing right next to him. She started saying things like, I know you felt that spark too, and you're such a good kisser. I just lost it. I snapped and told her straight up that she sounded desperate and pathetic for thinking a stage kiss meant they should be together. I told her she was crossing a line by going after someone else's boyfriend. She looked completely mortified and walked away in tears. Now I feel like a jerk because I know she's really insecure, and her friends have been calling me a bitch nonstop since then. They're all defending her like she's some kind of victim. I feel awful because I never meant to hurt her feelings. I was just fed up with her constantly overstepping boundaries. I'm really torn. On one hand, I feel like I did the right thing by standing up for my relationship and my boyfriend. On the other hand, I hate that she's crying and that her friends are attacking me. It feels like I'm being punished for defending myself and my relationship. I also can't stop thinking about why Victoria felt it was okay to pursue my boyfriend so aggressively. Is this how she acts with everyone? It's making me question her behavior and how she handles boundaries. I've been wondering if there was a better way to handle it, like having a private conversation with her about respecting personal space, or just letting my boyfriend deal with it. But in that moment, with everyone around and her being so bold, I felt like I had no choice but to speak up. So now I'm stuck dealing with the fallout from my actions and hoping that eventually, things will calm down and maybe Victoria will understand why I reacted the way I did. For now, I'm just trying to navigate this mess and hoping everyone involved can eventually move on. AITA for not wanting to buy my boyfriend's mom's overpriced house? My boyfriend and I are in the middle of buying a house for $330, and we've made the offer and done the inspection, and now we're just waiting to make sure all the paperwork goes through. We've got until next week to back out if we need to. The house we're looking at is on the small side, but it's cute and everything lines up perfectly. Then, his mom threw a wrench in the works. She offered to sell us her old house which is supposedly worth $500 and for just $350 and... Sounds like a great deal, right? Except this house is far from perfect. It's got some serious wear and tear, with issues like deteriorated pillars and the whole place needs a major remodel. Plus, we'd have to rent it from her for two years while we fix it up, which doesn't sit right with me because we wanted to avoid renting in the first place. The whole thing is stressing me out. $330 and is already stretching our budget, and now we're supposed to come up with a $350 and plus deal with all these repairs and rent. It feels like we're being pushed into a bad deal, and I'm really worried about what else might be wrong with the house. When my boyfriend asked if I wanted to buy his mom's house, I said no. It's just too much work. Plus, I'm not even sure if it's worth the $500 and she's claiming. He really wanted me to consider it, so I had him get some photos of the inside since I hadn't seen it before. Once I saw the pics, I was even more sure that it wasn't the right move. The place needs a ton of work, and on top of that, his mom wants us to hand over $100 and from the sale once we fix it up and sell it. After two years of renting, remodeling, and giving her $100, and, it just seems like a bad deal. I told him I still didn't want the house. He was like, fine, then you call my mom and tell her. 
I didn't want to be the one to do that because my relationship with her wasn't great, and honestly, I never said I wanted the house in the first place. So, he called her and told her I wasn't interested because it was too much work. He kept trying to get me involved in the conversation, but I just didn't want to. When I finally did talk to her, she guilt-tripped me, saying I was keeping him from a family gift. After the call, he told me he'd be upset for a long time if we didn't go through with it because he thinks it's a great deal. I'm starting to think there might be something fishy going on. If it's supposed to be a gift, why do we have to give her $100 and in the end? This wouldn't be the first time we've put effort into something for her without getting much back. I'm torn between feeling like I'm being a jerk for stopping him from what he sees as a blessing and feeling like I'm protecting us from a huge headache. We found a nice house that we both liked before the situation came up, and I think we'd be happier with that. Update after talking to my boyfriend and showing him this post. He claims she will help us pay for the renovations of this house if we buy it and will not let us get broke. He claims we won't have to give her 100, but instead, we will give her 50% of whatever we end up making off of it. In my opinion, it is still a bad deal. He claims he doesn't even care about getting the house anymore. Despite all the comments, he doesn't feel like he is being a mama boy or being delusional about it. In the comments, I mentioned that we started to fix up one of her house's basements so we could rent them from her. There was a lot of trash in there, so we spent days bagging it all up. After we cleaned it up, she went back on our deal and rented it to someone else. He says he isn't mad about that because we haven't put any money into it yet. We still ended up moving to a different basement in one of her houses. I told him that even though she gave us another basement, she still lied to us, so she couldn't be trusted. Oh yeah. She ended up throwing us out of that basement anyway and putting all our stuff on the street. Pretty much that basement ended up flooding multiple times because she didn't take proper care of it. Since it was unlivable, we went apartment hunting. She got mad at us for finding a new place to live and then threw us out on the street before our new lease started. She even locked us out of a lot of items and made us come back with the police to try to get them back. She tried to lie to the police and say we didn't even live there. All in all, he doesn't see that his mom can't be trusted, and I don't understand why. I'm about to explode. At this point, I am worrying about moving in with him at all. This will continue to be a lifelong problem he has. He finally came around, and we were going to get the original house as we planned. After talking to everyone here, our realtor and family members, they all said buying his mom's house was a bad idea. Thank you so much. Also, I am aware that buying a house before we are married is risky, but I do love him and hope to be married soon. Renting is such a big scam, and at the end of the day, at least we are putting our money into something that we own instead of down the drain with rent. AITA for not paying my roommate's faker bill? I'm 21F and live with three roommates, Mary, Kate, and Gwen. I make special brownies for my friends and stash them in my room, wrapped in foil and hidden in a bag. Last weekend I was out of town, and Mary was taking care of my cat while I was gone. Around 11 p.m. on Saturday, Kate called me, crying her eyes out, saying Mary was in the hospital. Gwen wasn't home yet, so she didn't find out until later. Kate told me Mary had found my brownies, helped herself to one, and then felt all woozy and out of it. She convinced Kate to drive her to the hospital. I told Kate that Mary had probably eaten a brownie with about 150 milligrams of something, and that she'd be fine. Just needed to rest, drink water, and maybe have some snacks. I wasn't too worried, it'd pass. I got home Sunday night to find Mary absolutely livid. She's blaming me for her, her visit and demanding that I cover her $3,000 in hospital bill because they ran a bunch of tests and stuff. I'm seriously torn. I don't think I should have to pay for her hospital bill, because I kept the brownies in my private space, not in a shared area. But Kate's on Mary's side, saying I should take responsibility. Gwen agrees with me but is staying out of it. So, would I be the asshole if I didn't pay Mary's hospital bill? I just feel like I'm being unfairly blamed here. Thank you. Edit, my roommates and I live in a legal state. I also do not bake the brownies in our apartment, so they probably didn't know I had them. I will be talking to them tonight over dinner. I'll be talking to my landlord about breaking the lease early, but ultimately I'm stuck until I can find another place to live. I have four missed calls from Gwen and a text saying we need to talk in person, but we won't both be home for another three hours. She's currently home, but
but I have classes. Wen texted me again and told me I need to come home right now, so I'm skipping my last class. I'll let you guys know about whatever this is. Wen texted me and told me to come home ASAP because we needed to talk in person. Basically, there was no our trip. I'm more well off than my roommates, I'm fortunate enough for my parents to pay for my college and rent as long as I keep a 3.5 GPA, and they equated that to me having money to burn I suppose. Apparently, Wen was home, in her room, while both Mary and Kate were also home. Mary and Kate were in the living room talking and Gwen overheard them and recorded their conversation. Unfortunately I can't share it with you as I'm in a two-party consent state and I'm not trying to get a real lawsuit, but Gwen's story was confirmed via the recording. Mary has been hanging out with some frat guys and apparently picked up sports betting. She managed to lose around $2,000 and threw her betting. You guys were also correct in claiming she might have found my brownies when feeding my cat previously. Apparently she had found them, opened them, smelled them, and knew what they were. Together her and Kate hatched a plan to pretend to get sick from my brownies and go to the air, and then convince me to foot the bill, since they know I don't like confrontation, and figured I would just do it to avoid trouble. They decided on $3,000 and so Mary could cover her debts and so Kate could get a cut for helping with her acting skills, calling me on the phone crying. I was fuming after hearing the recording. I immediately went to my room to make sure everything was there, and as far as I could tell everything was in its place, except for a gold and emerald necklace. This necklace isn't worth a ton, like $125 and, but it's from my deceased grandmother and means a lot to me. I'm not necessarily proud of this and you guys may not agree, but I went into Mary's room because I figured she had taken it to sell to cover her debts. Lo and behold it was hanging in her jewelry box. I thank Gwen for showing me the recording and her, my boyfriend, and I are packing my stuff as I type this update. I'm getting a storage unit and staying with my boyfriend until I can find another apartment, his roommates are okay with it given the situation, but it can't be long term as pets are against their lease. After I pack and move my stuff, I'm going to contact the landlord to see if they'll waive the lease breaking fee given the circumstances. Mary and Kate are already blocked. So yeah, not how I expected today to go, but at least I won't have to go to court or pay a fake $3,000 in her bill. Thank you guys for your advice. AITA for unintentionally making a family homeless? I feel really had about this and conflicted and could really use some perspective. I hope we can keep things civil here. So, I had this house down south. It wasn't anything fancy, just a cozy three-bedroom with a nice little garden. But the location was awesome, semi-rural with great connections to the city. Perfect for raising kids. I put it on the market for around $400,000 and... We got a ton of interest right from the start, and had to start meeting potential buyers to pick the right one. We met this couple who seemed perfect. They got two little ones and were super excited about the idea of moving in. Their kids had friends in the area, their parents were close by for babysitting, and they had a solid circle of friends nearby. We decided to go with them, and even agreed to sell for $10,000 and more than asking. We kicked off the legal stuff with the lawyers but hadn't wrapped things up yet. Then we received last minute an offer we literally could not refuse. These people are two men from the city looking to escape it for a quiet life. They have money, seem to come from money. They offer us a boatload of money cash. Our estate agent told us they wouldn't normally pass it on given, we'd accepted an offer. But this was too good to pass up. We contemplate, and we accept. Immediately after, we personally call the other buyers to explain that we are pulling out. They are of course devastated. We understand. We feel really bad, but we cannot turn this kind of money away. For us, it's a life-changing amount. We offer to pay any legal fees they've incurred to this point. They hung up on us, which sucked, but we understood. Some of our neighbors starts acting strangely. They won't say hello when they used to. Turns out the new couple have been spreading rumors about us. That we were nasty horrible, money-hungry people. With the current economic crisis, the bank withdrew their mortgage offer. Their landlord has already rented out their property and they have to move out. They're strictly homeless though they're moving in with their parents while they figure something out. Of course, I feel awful. But I can't turn this money down, and the new buyers are paying to expedite completion. I'm not in the habit of explaining myself, so I simply tell people who ask that it's complicated, and it was never our intention to make them homeless, even though they will have a roof. In the local Facebook group, my husband and I were attacked by an anonymous poster who ranted about how awful we were and money-hungry capitalists ruining a young couple's prospects. We weren't named, but if you knew anything about the situation, you'd know it was about us. We tried our best to soften the blow. 
we were to know that the economy would tank and they'd be left stranded, and we have to put our family and our needs first. I still can't help question if we are the assholes here. I've seen a lot of comments about not keeping my word, and it reminds me of my O-level study of Antony and Cleopatra. Antony, my word is my honor, and if I lose my honor I lose myself. Always loved that play. I don't explain myself because it's not their business. I've chosen an anonymous site for a reason. People are free to judge, but most are lying when they say they'd walk away from an offer 50% over asking. It doesn't reflect poorly on me to say that to adults with financial responsibilities and families of this I am now sure. This has opened many doors for us. We no longer have to take a mortgage on our new house. We get to live in our dream location for the rest of our years and leave our children, and hopefully grandchildren, something to set them up for life. We've bought a lovely house nearer to our kids, so we can see them more and be active in their lives. We can retire much sooner than we previously could have, and have no major debts hanging over our heads. I felt bad because these people were first-time buyers, and were enthusiastic about having a home in their community of choice. Upon reflection and, and reading some of these comments, I am content in our decision. They made a premature decision in handing in their notice, and they didn't do their due diligence on how buying a property works. They decided to say vicious things about us when we were courteous to them. I have not martyred myself at the expense of financial freedom and happiness for my family for people who turned out to be rather unkind. I'm more than okay with that. While it wasn't the intention of some of the commentators, they've helped realize that. If Reddit decides I'm the asshole, that's okay. I shall have to live with it. Thank you for your input. I think I'm going to go have a peaceful night for the first time in weeks since those whole debacles started.